so you still have access to this wealth of material. Didn't mean to stop you talking. <laughs> so, so, so I take it then, true or not, that this um, is an outline of what the book might look like the, in, in this sequence? Not, not sure. Right now, not, yeah, probably, yeah, let, let's yeah. say this, let's say this. Yeah. I mean, what's going to change? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've just got lots and lots and lots of notes. And um, one thing that I might, I might do a seminar um, which touches on oh, end of part four the problem of Euripides mm. because um, as I mentioned before everybody, everybody every philosopher hates Euripides from Plato to Heidegger to it, it's uniform it's always the same Aristotle too uh, tragedy has to be about, about unity of plot right? and if there's anything extrinsic which is introduced into it or excessive emotionality it's bad and um, in Sophocles he was always so the way it works is you've got Aeschylus um, ritualised stately slow big choral sequences you know it's like a operatic in that sense. The Oresti begins with these watchmen on the roof and it's dark and then these endless call sequences and then Clytemnestra appears sort of backstage shuffling around, you know, sneering at the chorus and then the thing builds like that. That's the Escalian model, which everybody likes. Sophocles, perfect human scale. Oedipus the king begins, Oedipus comes out and says, I'm Oedipus the king, what's the problem? And everything works. It's the most perfect example of plot for Aristotle because all of these shifts occur entirely organically. Right? The, two, the two mechanisms of tragedy, as you will know for Aristotle, are reversal and recognition. Right? Recognition is a move from ignorance to knowledge and reversal is a move from uh, reversal from one state to another state. Oedipus was king and he becomes exiled and he goes from ignorance to knowledge. And in the Oedipus the king, both things happen seamlessly. It's always held up as the example. You know, great humanistic Sophocles. And then Euripides is decadence, falling off, overly psychological, overly emotional, and introduces these extrinsic mechanisms like with the Deus ex machina. It's uniform. Mm -hmm. um, and then you find you know, people like Nietzsche saying Socrates helped Euripides write his plays. Mm -hmm. right? Tragedy doesn't die, it commits suicide through Euripides. Uh, there's more to be said for Euripides than that. A lot, lot more. And I'm, I'm going to use the Anne Carson angle as, as a way in Anne Carson's translations. Well, what I hear in the background are the three of the principles of, of philosophy of verification. Mm -hmm. And my contradiction, which you mentioned, and mm -hmm. then for the monstrous and for extensus is the excluded middle. Mm -hmm. That uh, inform the struggle. I mean, struggling, going for it, struggling for it, is struggling against it. Yeah. And why should. Why is contradiction a bad thing? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a whole movement in logic called um, dialetheism. The great rep representative of this is a, is a guy called Graham Priest, <coughs> which is about the logic of paradoxes. And they basically abandon the principle of non-contradiction. Just Aristotle says that contradiction is something that should be avoided. But they've now decided why. So, but as it were, the, the non-contradiction of the uh, the soul in in Plato um, is consistent with a certain um, philosophical principle. There are, except, there are exceptions to this. I mean, Hegel, but that's it separate. But uh, it, it will be. I don't know what sort of book it's going to be. 
Well, I've got this, um, lots of questions about it. Because I want, ultimately, I want to say something like, philosophy has to go back to theatre. That's what I want to say. There's a, there's a, there's a tragedy of the philosophers, <clears throat> which is interesting, compelling, but, um, and to, to go back to this question of praxis, it's the question of praxis that really interests me, and uh, to, to try and think about that. What I mean is that when we'll get to this, we'll get to this uh, on, on Saturday, but the philosophical reflection on the tragic in Hegel, Schelling, Heidegger, Lacan and others risks being a kind of idealised speculative model of tragedy philosophical conception of tragedy uh, which loses the dimension of theatrical praxis which interests me enormously so that's part of what I want to do but who knows Plato, questions about Plato or about anything else I found it a little confusing when in your presentation, where Plato says if, if you're grieving, grieve privately. Yes. It, the way you presented it, it sounded like if you're sincerely lamenting, pretend like you're not. It sounded like act, imitate. You're, you're sincerely too womanly, act like a man. Mm -hmm. Which. It's another uh, occurrence of. Mimesis in a way, yeah. It's interesting, I hadn't thought of that. So although you might experience huge grief at a loss of someone you love, you should imitate someone who hasn't. And that doesn't violate his rule against the acting? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't raise that in that connection. But it's a good point. He doesn't mention it, he just, he just drifts through that. It's an idea, it's an idea of the... Um, I forget what the Greek is, epikes or something, that, which, which Alan Bloom translates as gentleman, which is not wrong, right? How should a gentleman behave? And this means a certain restraint of emotions. Um, but it is a kind of imitation. It's, it's a fakery. Uh, it doesn't have to be seen as an imitation. It could be seen from his perspective as a hegemony of the logical part of the soul yeah. So actually. But you, yeah, you, yeah, you could. Uh, but the point is that you could be, um, let's say, genuinely torn inside about the grief that you feel, and you know that rationally it's nonsensical. It doesn't stop. But publicly, you decide to act a certain way. Um, you know, it's um, the point being is that is that philosophy. On this reading, and it's not—I'm not saying it's con conclusive or anything. It's—it's it's, it's a, it's a hypothesis, but there's some basis for it. Philosophy, on this view, is a disavowal of mourning. Because yeah. uh, mourning is a fundamental experience of being in contradiction with ourselves. Right? Someone has died. Right? Someone I love has died. Uh, they're gone and I'm torn against myself. I don't know what to do with myself. I can't become one with myself. Even when I know. I mean, the great text on this is Augustine's Confessions. Um, so, mourning introduces a splitting in the self, which we can experience in a very sort of straightforward way, right? That part of me has been ripped away when someone I love dies. And how do I carry on? They're gone. Right? I'm just, I'm divided against myself. And I see them and that's when people have, you know, psychotic aspects of mourning. Happens, it's had to happen to me and it's happened to lots of people. You see the person, that you see them everywhere, you know? And that goes on and on. Now, when that, when that becomes pathological, as Freud would say, it becomes melancholia. And you end up like Hamlet. Uh, the other alternative that Freud offers is that somehow in normal mourning you can internalise that 
you can internalize that in the self and it will dissipate. Um, tragedy is something, we, we see characters that are incapable of giving up, giving up their mourning. It's who they are. Right? They are injured. They're, they're radically injured and it completely messes them up. Clytemnestra, who we'll meet in the Oresteia, her daughter was sacrificed in order to enable fair winds so that the Greek or the Argive fleet could sail to Troy and get Helen back. The description of the death of Iphigenia, the daughter in the Oresteia, you find it elsewhere, and this is often, she's described as being um, gagged and hoisted up like a foal and her throat slit. Right? Gag her heart uh, unless she screams out. If she screams out, that will bring bad omens. Right? This is an act of brutal murder, which might enable a war to be pursued for what? To get back a woman that's been abducted or left for what? A city somewhere that you're going to destroy to rubble for what? You know, it goes on and on and on. But Clytemnestra hangs on to that grief, right? Throughout the entire history of the, the, the Trojan War she sets up a media relay system of beacons, which is how the Oresteia begins of beacons between, the, between Greece and Troy, a considerable distance, and she gets word that when, when the beacons are lit, she knows the war is finished, and she knows uh, her husband, who's responsible for the um, Agamemnon, who's responsible for the murder of the daughter, is on, a, on his way back, and she's sharpening the knife, right? preparing <laughs> the slaughterhouse. This is someone who's hanging on to her grief. Right? So, we find an Antigone too. Right? Antigone is defined by the injury that she she's experienced. That's what makes that gives her the identity that she has. This is uh, it's complicated, and we watch we watch these creatures in a sort of warlike situation, tearing each other to pieces. What do we learn from that? That's what we don't know. That's what. What does the spectator see in two people tearing each other to pieces? You know, or a, a, a grievance uh, from the past you know, that defines who you are and you will pursue it to the end. Um, that's what we're going to try and find out. Judith's going to say this is the condition for ethicality. <laughs> That's injurability, grievability, this is the condition of ethicality. This, as it were, being divested of one's identity is what relates you to others, negatively and positively. If we disavow that and believe ourselves independent, self-sufficient, we're truly lost. This could be the way she's going to take it. Um, I, I'm, I'm very drawn to that. <coughs> this, uh, this matches up with your... You worry about an infinitely demanding and one that, right? An ethics, mm -hmm. not an autonomous ethics, but an ethics that are you were, uh, hetero affectivity. Yes, right. Absolutely. I think that the, um, I think that the, uh, what I was calling tragic consciousness after Vernon this morning, um, lines up with an idea of hetero affectivity. Right. So, just explain that that the. Um, You know, what is subjectivity? Right? Subjectivity in its modern instance, we're told, is autonomy. Right? Uh, autonomy is giving the law to myself. And that's what freedom means. I give myself the law. And we assume autonomy is a good. Right? In can. In Hegel it gets socialised, it becomes the social work of autonomy. In, in, in Marx it takes on a, a different... Uh, formulation of that Hegelian 
Uh, it's an intersubject, it's, it's a communal, it's an association of free human beings, as Marx was saying, capital one somewhere, um, and so on and so forth. Habermas, it becomes uh, autonomy, it's intersubjective, practice of communication, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I want to do is to question the, um, not to question, not to say autonomy is a bad thing, but to question the, um, the authority of autonomy in, uh, in relationship to ethical matters, right? It's something that you know other people in Derrida has been all over this for, was all over this for an awful long time. Um, but and so it's an idea that um, <clears throat> subjectivity is not formed through a, a giving of oneself of the law or an idea of which an idea of self sufficiency, but through the um, through as it were being interpolated by an affect Right, the, the, as it were, that the really sunders you, that, that, that tears you apart. And it's that which can allow you to somehow commit uh, to the world, to, to commit to a course of action. And there's a lot more argument there. And, and, and uh, Judith's got an argument about um, um, you know, the, the idea that essentially uh, what it means to be a subject is to be, is to be vulnerable is to be undone. We're undone by each other, right? The condition of precarity, which is called precariousness, is the fact that we're undone by those who make demands of us. So, independence is a, a dangerous myth that accompanies phenomena like individualism and all the rest, and there's a, a model of subjectivity based on radical experiences of dependence. And, um, the two, the two great thinkers of that, uh, for my mind, are, are Hegel, who says little but that, right? Uh, Emphasise the bonds of dis dependence, but still, for Hegel, it culminates in a certain idea of autonomy. And for me, Levinas. Levinas is about an idea of the ethical subject based upon um, the, you know, the internalisation of, of, of a demand which you know, turns me against myself. So, so when. So when Socrates says the double man is a bad thing, I, I disagree. I guess that's what I'm putting it. I think the contradictory life is actually, the contradictory life is worth living. <laughs> and it, it, it is what we live. Um, and in many ways, I think, you know, the, the, not so much the philosophical task, but the, um, the moral and maybe ideological critical task that faces us is trying to sort of debunk uh, myths of independence or myths of, of, of unity which still govern the way we think about things. Right? Uh, connection to the whole, all this stuff. Um, could go on. I'll start talking about movies and you won't want to hear that because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I was about to talk about Avatar then but I just stop myself. <laughs> no! <laughs> Is there any relationship, or could there be a relationship developed between, as you wrote about before, the ethical experience and then theater? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, it's, um, yeah. <clears throat> There's a short answer. I mean, how, <laughs> how, how we do it, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I tried to do a few years ago, me and a friend of mine. Uh, in New York, tried to do a production of Rousseau's uh, play Narcissus, Narcisse, which was one of the first things that Rousseau wrote. And we tried to do it in this sort of form. It sort of worked, I don't know. It was, it was, it, the experiment was interesting, though. The actual practice was very interesting. Watching something take shape. Um, because the, 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 you know, the, the, the play Narcissus is a very slim thing, but it's about a man who um, is so narcissistic he falls in love with a portrait of himself dressed as a woman. Right? And he then runs all around Paris looking for this beautiful woman who's actually him. They, they play this joke on him. You know, do a portrait of him as a woman and he falls in love with the portrait. And then runs around Paris trying to find this woman. Ha ha. Yeah. The, but then Rousseau writes a meditation on this, on narcissism. So it's sort of, it, yeah. So you, yeah, it could become that, but it, it's... Uh, so for me, there is a link. 
And again, I mean, the, the, the dramatist who I think is closest uh, in, in my mind to thinking all this, trying to think this stuff uh, at the moment, is, is Euripides, who is. Um, it's, it's a sort of a chilling, um, a chilling, almost nihilistic universe, Euripides' universe, and I find it enormously attractive um, because characters, it's much more. I want to say contemporary in that sense. Uh, we'll, we'll go into examples tomorrow. But the Plato stuff is okay. I mean, you know, I mean, there are other ways. Of, I don't have. There's no key to Plato. Right? Every few years, someone finds the key to Plato, <laughs> and it's delusional. Last summer, some scholar in England of all places found the key to Plato, <clears throat> published something, and there was a discussion. It's, it's nonsense. There is no key. We'll never know. We have these texts. And there they are. We engage in an active interpretation. You could take this in a very different direction. So I'm pushing a quite pejorative reading of the Republic. A very partial reading of Plato. I'd like to know what bad you thinks of that argument. I'd like to, I'm curious. I've never really discussed that before. I'd like to know how far the, you know, the defensive philosophy, the defensive Platonism would go in this regard. I don't know. Anybody taken that up with them? Some of you have been in the students. I'd be curious to know. He, he presented on the Republic last year, right? Not specifically. No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> there were specific dialogues that were set Younger Socrates. Yes. And um, he has to agree to um, uh, a dialogue that, that he says, well, you have to agree to um, saying what I want you to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the opening pages seem to undo everything. How do we read that? Is it Plato making fun of himself? Or what? You know, what kind of irony is that? If irony, or self critique or um, criticism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's um, another completely consistent way of reading Plato is that Plato is about the staging of the movement into perplexity. So all this stuff I was presenting, Socrates says this and that, and you could, in, in reference to a dialogue like the sofas, completely complicate that. Heidegger's being in time, as you know, begins with this tiny little fragment from the sophist, where, which deals with, and if, you, if you read the context of the sophist that surrounds that, it's about the movement into aporia, the movement into perplexity. Right? Heidegger's stages being in time as, you know, not a discourse on being, but uh, a renewal of the question of being, the questionability of being. We've lost the sense for perplexity. We're no longer even perplexed. We don't even feel the question as a question. All he wants to do in being in time is to get the question up and running. And that's an entirely platonic task. So, yeah, there's the unwritten doctrine, uh, which is, I had a great lecture on that a few weeks ago, um, based on the Philebus, and the statesman, and there's, the, I mean, so Plato is a, it's a whole world, right? And this, this is a certain path through it in order to set and so I'm setting Plato up, Socrates up as the fall guy, against which tragedy will emerge as the hero. That's the sort of the broad sort of you know cinematic treatment of this, and then we'll move on. But it could easily be complicated. Um, symposium would take us somewhere else. Uh, Phaedrus would take us somewhere else. I mean, you know, Go on. 
what you think? Is is there anything uh, out of this small power and what it could do? Once again? Uh, is there anything that is existing out of the system of power and or what what you think that could do? What do you mean existing out of the system of power? I mean um, all social relations are somehow structured around a uh, kind of system of powers. Kind of mm -hmm. uh, also the theater as a kind of by-production uh, of kind of social relations or production of life. Mm -hmm. And when it was questionable is it, uh, when you said, uh, I feel agreed when I, uh, uh, when I owe someone uh, who I love, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, is it, uh, uh, and catharsis is a kind of a way to, to channel my yes. emotions, not yes. to, not to uh, direct them to the other people to hurt someone with yeah. not emotions, but to uh, to channel them to liberate my feeling for, that's, for a real. That world. seems to be what our second means. Yeah. But uh, is it enough to uh, legitimate uh, the tragedy in today's world of media, and when, when we know that tragedy is a very strong uh, machinery of by production? What's the last bit about bioproduction or yeah. say more about that? Uh, I mean about that uh, today uh, through the media, mm -hmm. I mean all the like tragedy, comedy, I mean in general theatre, they're living in a uh, kind of negated realities yes. in their productions and it's used to produce a life and we can say that it's not the real life. Yeah. So we are living in kind of false realities and I'm just questioning uh, uh, it's questionable. Do we need to support any kind of mediated reality? Mm. Well, there's a lot there. There's a lot to say. Um, I mean, tragedy is media, right? Yes. Um, tragedy is media theory. <laughs> media theory is tragedy, whichever way you want to spin that round. Um, the spectator in the, the, the spectator in the theatre is the theorist, is is the media theorist, and uh, tragedy theatre from the very beginning is playing very self consciously with its mediatized character, and uh, requiring all sorts of complex, using all sorts of complex strategies and requiring them of the audience. Um, <clears throat> The question that Socrates raises about tragedy and tyranny is not a stupid question, right? Uh, so I'm, you know, I, I'm going to defend an idea of tragedy, tragic ambiguity, blah blah blah. But the point that he makes that there is a complicity between tragedy, between as it were, the spectacle. Let's call it the spectacle, right? Democracy and democracy slide into tyranny is is a very strong point. No doubt about that. Um, it's the complicity of uh, it's the complicity of institutionalized forms of art with forms of state power, and tragedy is a great example of that. There'd be no tragedy without the city authorities, without wealthy citizens, without sponsorship, without all the institutions and mechanisms of the of the state apparatus. Absolutely true. Um, the peculiar thing about tragedy is that given all that, uh, we've got no idea why it looks the way it looks. And to give one example, <clears throat> relations between men and women in the city of Athens and elsewhere in Athenian city-states and elsewhere in the world at the time were very, very clearly regulated. Although it's something that uh, Western liberals don't want to uh, acknowledge, uh, when women, women were not allowed in the marketplace, uh, in the agora of Athens, uh, well, not, they were strongly discouraged from being in the marketplace. If they were virgins, they could appear, but not hang around. And if they were married, they had to be veiled. There was veiling in Greece. Right? So we think of that as some barbaric non-Western practice, but you know, there was, women were veiled, full face, and there's, there's the, there's, you can find uh, sculpture depictions of that, right? 
It's fascinating. I didn't know that until a few months ago. Um, what's the point? The point is that relations between men and women were clearly organised. Athens was a, a patriarchal society of a very uh, clear type where power was organised a certain way. What on earth is going on in this? Where those relations seem to be at least in play, maybe questioned, maybe up for grabs. And so Nicole Loho, who's a much better scholar than I will ever be, says, we don't know. Is this a deviation from the norm? Or is this, is, is this deviation from the norm? Or is this deviation from the norm that just confirms the norm? We don't know. Is this men dressing up as women? And men love to dress up as women, as we know. And sort of playing at women, and then you know, getting off on the emotions, and then going back to their normal lives. We don't know. The whole thing might be a huge, you know, sort of form of travesty which is completely complicit with the patriarchal order. Seems to be the case. There's a lot more we can say about that. So we don't know. But it, it's odd that uh, given uh, sexual power relations in Athens that this should be going on in theaters. At least, it's, at least it's a, it's a, it raises a question. The other side of the question that you raise, uh, well, is there something outside the... Um, system of power relations, well, I don't know. Um, again, another part of Socrates' argument, which is powerful, is that he wants philosophy to try and be outside that system of power relations. Right? The goal of the philosopher is to hold the city at a certain distance. Right? To, um, and to try and deal with it justly. Um, you know, the only people that should have power are those who don't want power and the rest. There's a certain, you know, the philosopher wants to be somewhere else. He wants to be contemplating the forms. That's clear. We have to drag him back into the cave. Why? It's never explained. In the myth of the cave, you read it. The person escapes, gets up from the cave, goes to the light, and then at a certain point thinks, oh, I've got to go back. Why? Just, if you read the text, it just, it just goes back uh, and tries to liberate others. But he wants to be somewhere else. So in a sense, philosophy on a certain model is an attempt to leave that system of power relations. Um, the other side of the question that you raise, which is interesting, I just don't have the answer for, but it's really on my mind, is if, is if, is if, uh, if, as I said a few minutes ago, I want to go back to theatre or return philosophy to theatre, uh, the question is where is theatre now? And what is theatre now? That point, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's in theatre. <laughs> we could talk about that. I don't know what you think. Well, what do we think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think the best place to look. Okay, is come on, let's let's talk about it. I mean, uh, here is life. Today we have the long meters of life to communicate. So why are we here? Why are we saying it's only here? Mm -hmm. Or it just it could be um, politics in general. Politics is theatre, right? Uh, law is theatre. Yeah. Uh, law courts are based on theatrical constructions, I think we always forget. Um, teaching. Teaching okay. is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know about that one, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I come, I'm back. I'm, I'm you have to prepare. You have to, you have to prepare, that's for sure. I'm yes. very well prepared, you can see. <laughs> but but if, you, if you imitate, you're always lost. If you think you're playing a role, you're not playing a role. I don't think so. You can't teach and play a role. The, the students always see through you. You've got to be Lucretinus 
piece of dirt that you are. <laughs> so I was in the hope that they don't throw things at you. <laughs> so my approach to teaching, you know, just hope that they're going to not come and grab you out of the room and say you can't do this anymore. But um, I don't know. I don't know. The media thing, I mean, you, you know more about this than I do. You know, I'll just start talking about movies. That's my problem. But isn't there, I mean, within social networks today where you can take YouTube clips and take small clips of movies, take small clips of music, you can be live chatting with a friend, so you're technically maybe not in a theatrical position, mm -hmm. but you're adding all these other sort of theatrical techniques to real time, to your everyday existence. And then you also have other technical devices, cell phones, uh, you know, or your, or your computer laptops. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a convergence where there's a question that keeps coming up. Uh, I'm, I've been working a lot on Virilio's work where we are. Right. There's, a, there's a question of uh, when, 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 do, when do we enter into a theatrical uh, space and leave the theatric, theatrical space mm -hmm. to the sort of fine space of the theater, whether even if it was on television, uh, that, we, that seems to be fading a little, or at least it's, it's going, and we don't quite know how to that place television it. is, you know, there, there's a great, I saw a great documentary recently by a guy called Johan Grimonprez, a Flemish um, uh, <laughs> documentary maker, artist, called Double Take. If you get a chance to see it, it's great. It's about Hitchcock's doubles, and it's about a lot of things, but it's about the moment when Hitchcock goes from movies to television in the early 60s. He starts to, you know, which is how, when I, Thought of Alfred Hitchcock when I was 15 years old. He was that old fat guy that used to introduce those half an hour TV shows, you know? Didn't know he made all these films. And, but it's also secondarily about the death of television. Television is it's dead, or it's dying, right? It's dying. Not really. Oh, come on. No. No, it doesn't say it's not. First of all, it's reinventing itself. Because it depends what you consider television. Television now is a screen. Because content is made only for not only for television, but uh -huh. content is made beyond the context of television through social media and whatever that. So it's becoming a screen. Yeah. No, that, that that's for sure. But I think that the I mean, you know, the idea of the idea of television that uh, was inculcated into me as uh, a young person in England in the 60s and 70s is dead. Right? Mm -hmm. That idea of essentially um, a state-controlled uh, mediation of culture right? that would determine what was good and what was bad. It was the it was the, the gatekeeper between you and the world, and you trusted it because you knew it was operating in your interests. Right? That's the way ideology works. That that seems to have radically fragmented into you know maybe what we're talking about. The um, I don't know when you say that, Drew. How do you see? Because there's a sort of you know um, who says? I mean, Freud says somewhere that man is a prosthetic god. Man is a prosthetic god. So here I am. You know, I've got my prostheses, you know, and I am I'm divine. I'm completed at some level by these implements, right? Um, how do you interpret if that? I mean, that is a reality. The one you're describing, I completely agree. But what do you want to do with it? Well, I mean, I, I, in relation to theatricalization, well, I, mean, I think. I mean, I can't help because because I. Your work a lot was thinking about uh, Artaud's theater of cruelty and the concept of the Good. theater of cruelty. Good, okay. yeah. Okay, and so Artaud trying to seeing that uh, in his mind that the world was losing some sort of salvatory position mm -hmm. with the loss of uh, concrete uh, ideas of good and bad and, and uh, religion to the mixed in and, and the horror of his times. Uh, striving to have a theater that would that would sort of shock the audience, but also bring them to be a part of the audience in a pre- or post-subjective position of affect, kind of what you were getting at. So there's a sort of a sort of call back to theater, but in his mind, ironically, whenever we move from, from theater to, to silent films, at the same time which he was part of, but then trying to re-gauge somehow a sort of new sort of theatrical 
uh, event of some sort. Okay. That this, sort this, of blurred this, the line yeah. of the stage and, and the this spectator. Is this is good. This uh, is good. And so when I think of, for example, Facebook, which I, I like and I've been using a lot in, for, for business, but also for just philosophical curiosity and other things, uh -huh. there's this sort of mi minor electroshock where you get an email or you get this thing, but it's not just an email where you check your email. Now I got a, I got a message, and there's a certain shock of a message, but there's a constant red light goes off whenever you get uh, someone likes something or sends you something. And it's this sort of repetitive thing that sort of, it, 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 and for me it seems like a new sort of space that can be all sorts of things, but at the same time there's a theatrical, a theatricality there that is undeniable. Uh, there's a theatricality there that's undeniable. You, you, uh, is that, yeah, go on. I mean, you, you choose pictures of yourself, but others choose it for you. It becomes sort of mask, a continuous procession of, of masks at the same time. So, I mean, I think there's... Literally tragic. Yeah, no, there's tragedy and there's a certain catharsis well, yeah. that can play out. I mean, it's... Really awful. You know, there's... I have friends that were in Japan during all the tragedies there recently that, that uh, you know, from a distance and it's sort of television, we were connecting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, and even though she was there and we were connecting, I hardly ever talked to her, but she was in the morning and mm -hmm. reached out to me. It's eight in the morning, I'm having a coffee in a coffee shop somewhere. She's getting ready to go to bed and finally has realized that uh, what has happened there is quite horrible. Mm -hmm. And so there was this moment that was real, very real and very, uh, you know, a moment of losing yourself and sort of, I hadn't thought of her in a while, of course I was wondering how she was doing. Mm -hmm. And yet there was this weird sort of position where you, you know, I feel like there's this sort of theatricality that, that, that comes and goes there and pops up in these sort of spaces of social media where um, there isn't a sort of st stability of what, what could be going on. You know, at one moment it's a very strict business you technique, use it to, to, to do regulate your business. At another moment it's, uh, talking with friends, and in another moment it's, it's these sort of cathartic experiences. What do you think about this? Moment, what do you think, what are we, you were, it can be tragic, I think Mike wants to come in as well. Yeah. No, I mean, um, I'm happy to make one at the same time. Um, which is it's the good, situation it's good. of that. It's good, it's good. I'm someone who doesn't do Facebook, because <clears> I don't like that awful experience of, if someone's like asking, like, you know, saying like, you're cool, and someone's saying, <laughs> you know, it's like, and then always people taking people always going around taking photos of themselves to post so they can show people where they were. Or it's like the goats, like suddenly the goats, you know, everywhere. All my friends will see the goats or something. Right. I just I find that experience of life not very interesting. This this is good, right? Okay. But uh, this, I have this no trouble goes. with I'm multiple positions. I mean, but I'm also someone who has multiple positions put upon me. I have to kind of you know. I've, I've always had to na navigate multiple multiple subjectivities, multiple roles. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that as a liberation. I don't see it as a as, as something exciting. Yeah. You said it was tragic. What's tragic? I mean, it, it was a joke, but it's like, tragic. Oh, tra I mean, it, it's a tragic joke, but it's scene. also you, you know these these people you know like like people bullying. You know, you read about oh. this kind of thing. I mean, there are these tragedies that play themselves out through this kind. This is complex you know, and it's kind of intensified. Yeah. And if we get back to space. Yes, it's also, the, I think it was, I don't know, we've got to this last, did we talk about this last summer? The sort of, at some point, maybe with um, John, I don't remember exactly, but I'd be very curious about <coughs> groups who've decided to turn their back on all these forms of mediation and go back to, say, pamphlets, right? Go back to the circulation of you know I'll I'll write something put on a bit of paper and then give it to my friend or give it to another friend and at the end of two weeks, fifteen people have read it or it's been thrown in the bin or something. But there's, or you, you hand you handwrite a note or whatever. There's a sort of I'm interested in these the cult. There's that side of things. When you talk about Arto, uh, I'll I'll mention Arto on Saturday just by chance uh, because. Uh, I'm going to talk about disgust on Saturday 
Um, and the context, you know, we don't need to go into now, but the question I have, I'm thinking of Artos Theatre of Cruelty, I'm thinking of holy disgust in people like Bataille, is what, where we find disgust, right? Uh, at least in the experience of disgust, there's a, either an appreciation of distance or a, a threat of distance collapsing or something like that. So that's one thing that interests me. It seems to me that the, the problem with one's prosthesis is um, it's, it, there's a theatricalization of life for sure, but how does that link up with the... Um, well, you know, when Aristotle says, right? Tragedy is a mimesis of an action which is elevated, complete, and of magnitude in language embellished and with artistic devices and through pity and fear accomplishing the catharsis of such emotions. Right? He thinks of catharsis as some... that the work of theatre is able to exert a huge power over the audience, and in such a way that that, that emotion is both felt and transformed at the same time. Is that taking place in this scenario? There's a sort of, you know, the problem is, is that we, you know, there's a sort of, um, you get what I'm saying, right? Um, what do you think? And Michael wants to come in as well. Uh, well I genuinely haven't got a clue about this. Theatre, you were talking about the what is the modern theatre, and through the idea that spectators maybe to look at how that's changing. So instead of looking at the, the theatre itself, can we basically liberate ourselves from the geography of the theatre? Yes. So that the spectator now we have a, we carry a theatre around with us all the time. Absolutely. So yeah. the, the geography has changed. We've liberated ourselves from the place, and we also can have it as an extension of ourselves, like a prosthetic body. But we also are very aware of ourselves and we as a participant. Yeah. So we are the actors as well in the drama of our own lives, which may be a tragedy. Well. In some ways, <laughs> because the tragedy how are we going to reconcile ourselves within a life that we are the participant of? See, this is the problem. The problem, the, the way that this is, you know, in, in terms of the classical genres, I think this is important. Um, <clears throat> when, when uh, you know, when uh, Aristotle says here, uh, the essential element to tragedy, and you find this some lo in Longinus and elsewhere, is grandeur, right? Megatos, and grandeur requires nobility of character. This is the importance of nobility. If the character is not noble, right, this is why it's always the, it's always royal families that are the subject of tragedies, right? Because it, in that view, it's the nobility of character and its downfall that touches us, right? If that nobility is absent, it becomes comedy, and comedy feeds off the petty, the small, us. We're comic. Always, our lives are always comic. So, the, the, was the, the Aristotelian response was, "Where is the nobility?" Um, does that make any sense? Well, the, you you find that the thirteenth Brumaire, you know, Marx, where versus tragedy, then it's the first tragedy, and then it'd be a comic, good title for a book. Marx. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, that's that's the possibility. But again, go back to the subject again in our own lives. How does that tragedy, how does the tragedy of the world play out? And I was thinking too, a little bit sideways here, but the coldness you were talking about. Yes, coldness. Earlier, well, Adorno talked about that. Yes. In the fact that we, when we live in a world of instrumental reason, yes. we are cold. I mean, his uh, education after Auschwitz, he talks about how are we going to move beyond that? Not just the lyrical poetry, but how are we going to move beyond that? And now in a world where we are so self the subject of ourselves. So in other words, to extend what um, um, William said here, it's not just the reflexive mind, it's the self-reflexive mind. Yeah. So we need to move beyond that, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. I, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Adorno is an interesting character to introduce mm -hmm. at this point, I think. 
So we've examined theatre as a situation, and we've gone through various, various presentations, and we've examined the spectator, and you've raised the point that the spectator now is the actor. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about the actor as somebody who is in the process of mimesis, in the process of mimicking. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to point out that in his notes for the Free Penny Opera, Brecht says almost the oh. opposite of that, when he says, actually, he would, he would hate Robert De Niro and Taxi Driver in this whole right. complete, you know, filling right. out of the character and backstory because his entire point was he wanted his actors to be effectively a blank screen and basically a cipher for the play because it was the yeah. play, it was the structure that they were in that was important to Brecht. Now, you can make of this what you will, I kind of like Taxi Driver myself, but um, I like that he gained something like a hundred pounds for Raging Bull by travelling through Italy and eating pasta for three months and stuff like that. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. But when we are talking about actors, I mean, this is a possibility and maybe one of the interesting elements in this kind of Facebook social media saga is how much we are just a cipher for this structure of this self-perpetuating structure of the media itself, how much we are just a blank screen onto which it perpetuates projects itself. A few corporations. <coughs> but if you imagine arguably with that Brecht was epic theater. So mm -hmm. he wanted to smash the audience out of the narcotic yeah. illusion that they were in. So he would you would you know I agree he wouldn't he hate Robert De Niro because that only contributes to the yeah, illusion. Sure. And yes. what he wanted to do was awake the audience from that illusion. But of course the problem is the audience does not respond to shock according to see people being smashed by rifle butts, but eventually, or at some point, there is an enjoyment in that. There's an aesthetic oh, yeah. appreciation of violence. So again, we're in a, in a position where epic theater is really going to work. The Brechtian version. In Brechtism, in Brecht, sorry, Elizabeth, Brecht um, uh, did a version of Antigone, uh, which was performed in Switzerland, actually, in 1944, I think. I might be wrong about that. Um, picture in the war. And no, 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 it's after the war. Oh, it's some AC. Anyway, it begins with uh, in Berlin, um, and Antigone is presented as a sort of freedom fighter, as a, you know, an uncomplicated figure who, I mean, it's not a great play, but the point being is that there is. You know, one side you've got Artaud's theatre of cruelty, which is one way of producing a wake-up call. Right? Brecht's got another way of producing a wake-up call. Right? This is a play. You're in a theatre. This is the state of the world. Do something. You, know, you get that. You know, the alienation effect, and then you're called up short. But you can only pull that card so many times. Franco B hmm? is an example. Franco B. If you've seen him, he's a Performance artist who has covers himself with blood and gore, his own blood, and that is it's kind of a modern theater of cruelty, which is going on right now. He does his performances in right. public places. He'll be there. And but, that, and but this is. But then there's this. There's this really um, nagging question about the. Um, uh, you know, you wake up. Oh, another fifty people have been shot at a funeral again. God, so what am I going to have for breakfast? And there's that <coughs> sense of, you know, we're, we're so uh, informed and um, immunised against contact with the real. So we, I, 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 my question is where these moments of the real bubble up. I'm, I'm just, well, yeah, I right. hear what you're saying. Because I also have a difficult time, actually, with the concept of imitation or mimesis, uh -huh. of figuring out what, 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 what the contingencies are that make it so that that concept can be clear. In my mind, like what 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 is an what is the phenomenon? What is the imitation? It, it seems like a very, or do we have to also believe the tragedy is pure? Imitation? The phenomenon is action, and I, I know, but but yeah. in, in many of these situations, 
those those vectors become very, oh, oh, absolutely. very difficult to distinguish. Absolutely. So in some ways it seems that that concept is maybe doesn't is 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 almost too crude. Or it's been yeah, I mean it, it's it's I mean, theatre is premised on the idea that we know that theatre is theatre. Right? We know what's, what's an imitation. We already know that theatre is that. that. We, and we that, don't need Brecht to tell us that. Yeah, and that's, that. that's unstable. That, that's radically unstable. We don't need the play to tell us that. Nicholas Lindgren. It's a little, uh, we'll go back. It's okay. Really no, I just wanted to point out, when uh, you said that this spectator now doesn't have any border, because it's becoming too connectivity. It's becoming as a Wagner, as a, uh, allow me my ignorance. I don't remember what he said, I mean, the, the title, but the, the actor is becoming the maker of the play. It's the, it's the G, I don't remember that. So Bob. what I want to say is that today the spectator, through connectivity and through the tools that we, are, we have available, can make of the play. There is a, a, a blurring between spectator and being an actor and maker of the play. I don't know if I'm clear enough. No, you're clear, but see, the, the, I want to drew, but I suppose that a question, it came up before when, um, uh, I don't know when Michael spoke, but um, I guess part of my, I think, I'm not saying nothing has changed. I'm not saying there's nothing new under the sun. But the, um, the sense of connectivity, reflexivity, and all these problems of theatricalization are, I think, powerfully at work in someone like Euripides. Right? Even Brechtian moments, you'll pull back and say, this is a play, look at what's going on. Or you read Aristotle, it's not as... So it's... <clears throat> What am I saying? It's confusing. Tragedy, or you know, these these things speak to us um, in a way. Um, you see, it sounds like a little bit like a sort of techno optimism here. From me? From you? No, not at all. Okay, <laughs> we'll go, go on. Uh, I mean, Divest I, I, me of I, that. I, of that I, I, I think. I think it's not. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's an optimism at all. I think. I think. Uh, okay. At any minute, you can you can go from being in the real, enjoying your every day, enjoying your cup of coffee, and then you're in somebody else's morning play, mm -hmm. like that. Right. Now you can choose to, to try to get away from that, mm -hmm. and that's part of reality too. I mean, it's it's. I mean, you walk in, your colleague has just lost uh, somebody, you know. So I mean, it's it's not so much, but. What happens with, with the distance, for one thing, too, which is predicated on being a spectator mm -hmm. somewhat in your own life, like we were getting at, with the distance itself. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a constant blurring between uh, here and there, and they, they get kind of put into each other in a sort of weird reverb. I'm not, I'm not so optimistic about it. I've seen a lot of interesting, positive things about it. I've seen a lot of confusion and hallucinatory sort of weirdness and questioning, and, and uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's such a complicated, mediated space, theatrical space in general, where uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to be optimistic about it. I think, okay. I think you know, at all. So I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm right, not, fair I'm enough. not against it, but. I hate him. No, it's fair enough. Yeah, so the last word here, then we'll. Oh, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, I think I'm extremely pessimistic, actually. I mean, this, you know, in the discussion of uh, Facebook, it's, such a, it's been very essential to, like right before I got into college, is really kind of when my whole age group got into this. Um, and I think especially from a psychoanalytic perspective, if we're thinking of the ego as that image, that object we have of ourselves, yeah, which is precisely not ourselves, it's misidentification. I think of, and I know this term has been used before, but I think of Facebook as, you know, an ego machine. And especially if you're talking about you know idealizational mass for the ego, it's like it's even locked in even further, um, you know, with the, with the status function on Facebook, and it says, uh, you know, tell people what you're thinking, tell people how you're doing. Yeah, we all know there's a subliminal messages, you know, tell people what you want them to think. 
that you were thinking right now. It's the, right? Imagine, it's just, it's the imaginary it's, like concept. Exactly, and then, you know, it, it's not like, what is my favorite movie? It's what do I want people to think my favorite movie is? I mean, it's, this is, again, basic performativity, but it gets locked in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the structure. Because we you get the last word, Nicholas. Oh, sorry. We are in a moment of transaction, uh, transition. Because it's like YouTube. When YouTube came out, you saw cats flowing from the windows, etc. Now YouTube is becoming something else. And Facebook is the same. For example, now in transmedia, we are using, to, we are trying to use YouTube as a tool of having content, meaning that we trigger somebody, and then somebody else is going to post something. Not only video, not only um, writing, but it's a tool of conversation that becomes content. We are in a moment of, we don't know what's going on. I don't know if I can. I had a conversation, we should have, it's dinner time, yeah, I had a conversation with Hendrik uh, Speck last night, uh, which was for about half an hour, and he has this way of speaking, which is just, he has this use of audibility, I sometimes just can't hear what he's saying, I get it, and wow, he, he was explaining to me how he sees things, and I suddenly realised you know, how little I knew, and you know, how a huge mistake, I realised a huge mistake I made. Fascinating, but you know, and, and he, in a sense, there's a realism there. Yeah. Um, but it's, I guess, it's there's a pessimism as well in the sense in which you know there's a real issue about news reporting and all that stuff and the movement towards entertainment, blah blah blah. We could talk about that, but I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a techno pessimist or optimist. You know, damn thing is making noise. <laughs> I mean, the the what am I saying? Human beings are prosthetic animals, right? And uh, the um, this period of whatever happens in this Athenian moment is a kind of uh, a certain acceleration of a set of media relays of which we, you know, are, are the effects of some level.